They're just sassy ladies. Yeah. Um, takes his mask off and he's like, can I have your autograph? <laughs> Makeshift booth for me out of sound blankets and tea stands. I have no idea what happens to Mikasa in the final season. I have no idea if they're gonna get their townhouses. I hope they do. They were like, somebody's over there with a clipboard. They know what's going on. My babies are cold and they all just like came at me. Now, coverage like no other. Bringing you videos from the event floor. You're watching convention coverage. I'm Trina Nishimura, and it is so nice to see you, and it's so nice to see you again. Yes, welcome back. Thank I think you. the last time I saw you, we had you at the Roseville show. Is that yeah. true? Oh, my God, that was like four years ago. No, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, if you want to count, sure, but... <laughs> Who counts? Yeah. 2020 never happened. Two years. I, I don't make me look up pictures. <laughs> I'll look it up and check the date. I had to do that with Kenny James earlier. He's like, no, that was 2018. I was like, no, that was 2019. <laughs> Well, it's you, good to see you again. You as well. How have you been? Good. Good. Um, the new season, or the final season of Attack on Titan is coming out tomorrow. <laughs> so we're excited about that. Um, the uh, My Hero Academia movie has been amazing. Everybody's really enjoyed it, so we're excited about that. Uh, I have some exciting news to report ooh, at some ooh, point. Ooh. Not today, but oh. probably next week on Tuesday, maybe. Uh, exactly on Tuesday, maybe. Yeah, and, the NDA uh, expires, and I can now talk about it. it, that, it next Tuesday. <laughs> next Tuesday, next Tuesday after 12 o'clock uh, Pacific time, I can talk about it. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can uh, add me on social media, and that is where I release things. Uh, but it is so nice to see everybody. I'm so excited to be here, finally. And, uh, yeah, that's all I have. Excellent. Right on. Uh, I was wondering, I asked already Morgan Berry this, but how did you start off your voice acting career? Uh, how did I start my voice acting career? So I was an actor first. I started acting when I was, uh, or auditioning, when I was nine years old, and I started working with my local community theater in my small town that I grew up in called Amarillo, Texas. Uh, and then I started touring professionally when I was 13 years old. Why my mom decided that was a good idea to let a 13 year old go out on the road by herself, I will never know. I think she just needed like a break from one of the four of us. Uh, but yeah, so I started touring professionally when I was 13. And then I um, just kind of kept going with it. I went to college and I was uh, planning on going into law school, maritime law specifically. Uh, and a friend of mine told me about an audition at Funimation and voice acting. And I was like, no, Jimmy, I'm very grown up now. I'm going to be a lawyer. You don't even know my life. And he was like, it pays. I was like, when's the audition? <laughs> and I auditioned and I was cast. Uh, my very first show was um, Desert Punk. Uh, about 20 years ago, because I'm old, and uh, you know. I earned it, earned it. Um, so yeah, uh, about 20, almost 20 years ago, it was yeah. 2005, uh, four, maybe three, Any, somewhere in there. Um, and I started uh, back in the acting world, and I started doing theater again. I started auditioning again, I got an agent, and then things just kind of snowballed, and I was like, I don't want to be a lawyer. And so here we are. Ta -da. Thank you. Thank you. What is like one of your favorite um, uh, roles in like anime? Uh, my favorite roles that I've done or just in general? Just like in, in, like general? in general. Oh, sure. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Cowboy Bebop ever. <laughs> um, Very obscure <laughs> show. Cornerstones of anime. <laughs> right? Uh, right? It's like um, the intro anime. It's like the one you show everybody, it right? It totally is the intro Like, here, watch this. It's, that was the very first anime that I ever watched. It's the non weeb anime. Uh, now I feel old. <laughs> no, well, not the very first. I mean, in my, in my household, when my brother was like, oh, let's watch Speed Racer, that was just a cartoon. There you go, Mock Go Go. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't like, um, this is anime and this is a cartoon. Yeah, like, it, was it was just a cartoon, cartoon back then. Uh, but, um, the, you know, once I was older and um, kind of, I met this boy in college and he was great and really cool and he played in a band and whatever. Um, oh and he was like, oh yeah, I really love Cowboy Bebop. I was like, me too. I love it. I love it so much. Um, you did it, didn't you? you, I, you. I totally <laughs> lied. And uh, then I went to this place uh, that is this archetypal, uh, archety arch uh, not archetypal, it's a um, 
It's this place that holds records, right? It holds all archive. of this information. Archive, thank you. This archive place uh, where you would go and you would collect these uh, mythical things called VHSs. Um, and you would plug them into An a cube. the Stone Age. <laughs> it was called Blockbuster. <gasps> so I went to Blockbuster and I got all of Cowboy Bebop and watched it and loved it. Uh, but to say, uh, and then we, we actually dated for a really long time and then it went sideways. But still good friends, still good friends. <laughs> um, and so I was actually, yeah, it doesn't matter. So I went to Blockbuster, I got, um, I got Cowboy Bebop and I love all-time favorite character in anime, all-time favorite, Ed. A hundred percent Ed. I thought you were going to say Spike. <laughs> Spike is great, but Ed. Ed's, I love Ed's cool. Ed. I, I, like, I like them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the questions. That was very kind. I appreciate it. I have a question. Like, I, I'm sorry. I get okay. kind of nervous. Time. It's okay. Well, I do plan on hiring actors for animation and filmmaking, and I kind of want to some advice on how should I approach and hire here actors? actors? Yeah. Sure. Well, number one, congratulations on pursuing your dreams, especially in the world of arts. That's never easy. It's always something that's challenging and hard to explain to people, at least in my experience. So congratulations on one, making the decision, and two, publicly announcing it here. That's fantastic. It, it is, right? Yeah, you can Thanks. clap. We don't have to golf clap. We're having fun. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. You know, we're having a good time. Uh, I think it's great, so that's one. And two, um, if you want to hire actors and things like that, uh, it just depends. It depends on where you're recording, it depends on where you're producing, and, and all of these other legal things that are far above my pay grade. But typically, like hypothetically, if you're like, hey, Trina, there is this role that I would really like to cast you in, or there is this role that I would really like for you to audition for, uh, then you can either, A, uh, in my experience, I've been approached directly by producers, directly by directors, directly by studios, or I audition through my agent, um, my talent agent who will send me auditions, or uh, some people in LA, for example, it works a little bit differently, so maybe their manager sends them stuff. So it really just kind of depends. But hypothetically, in your situation, I'm guessing you're an indie sort of artist situation. So College probably, student. <laughs> awesome. So you probably have kind of a low budget. So something that might be a good idea for you specifically, like let's say you're working on a series, like an animated series, yeah. you could make a pilot. So a pilot is just producing one of the episodes, and then you take that pilot and you pitch it to different people, right? So you could use your friends or other actors or even actors at your university and be like, hey guys, and post in the theater area like what you're auditioning for and then audition some actors within the community. And then once you have that pilot, you can pitch it to different places and say like, hey, is this something you'd be interested in making? And you have kind of a roundabout thing. And then once somebody, if, not if, when somebody says yes to your project, because we're manifesting people, uh, when somebody <laughs> says yes to your project, then you can be like, you know who I'd really like for Susan or Jamie or Donald, I don't know where those <laughs> names came from, uh, for these characters is this actor or that actor or this actor, and then you have a little bit more flexibility. But I'd recommend starting with a pilot. Thanks. You're welcome. You here, are you here in Sacramento? Me? Yeah. Oh, I actually go to college in San Francisco, the Academy oh. of the Arts. Oh, okay. that's perfect. Let me know. I'll work for free. Thanks. <laughs> he works for, and he, listen to <laughs> this man's voice. I mean, it is fantastic. When I came up here, I was like, why don't you work in this? Uh, sorry. I want to work in the business. Actually, it's a dream job. I mean, I don't, do you know the names Jason Marnoka or Frank Todaro? I don't. Um, Jason was Coach Nanbu in Megalobox. Oh, yeah. And Frank's been doing a few things. Both of them, I'm a big Transformers fan. Yeah. And in the recent Netflix series, the three series they just did on Netflix, uh -huh. Jason's Megatron, Frank is Starscream. Oh, that's and They're actually both friends of mine. That's wonderful. And I was like, kind of like name drop to feel powerful. But uh, I know they're getting into the industry. I mean, you got to pay your dues like anywhere yeah. you go. And that's, that's kind of like I have that fear of transition to pay the dues because I got bills to pay so you can still pay the dues while yeah. paying the bills yeah you know I, I think until the, until I was 30 I worked at least minimum three jobs every like at minimum I'm, I'm minimum three jobs uh until I was uh in my 30s yeah. for sure like you know as an artist you never know like when 
when something's gonna hit, when something isn't, how long you're gonna ride a wave, when the wave is gonna poop out, and, and there's no telling. There's the, if you're looking for stability, this isn't the job. <laughs> but um, if you're looking to pursue your dreams and you have something to say and you're a storyteller, no one's going to stop you. So, Thanks. Yeah. And you have your first actor. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. You. I can't wait for Attack on Titan final season part two. Yeah, me too, honey. <laughs> Thank you. My question for you is, what's your favorite line as Mikasa? My favorite line as Mikasa? Um, my favorite line as Mikasa is in the very first season and without any... Uh, has everyone here seen the first season at least? Yes. Cool, cool, cool. So in the very first season, in episode four, I think it was, Aaron dies and he gets eaten by a titan, right? Um, yep. And in that moment, I just spoiled it for the boys. I just realized that. I'm sorry. Once you're older, <laughs> these are my cousins. I'm sorry. Uh, and they haven't seen Attack on Titan because, um, but they have seen my hero. And uh, eventually they're going to see Attack on Titan. And maybe you won't remember this. I don't know. Uh, so, yes. Uh, my very favorite line is after she, Mikasa finds out that Aaron has had this accident and is dead. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, after she finds out Aaron is uh, dead and she's in this really emotional state and she's very upset and she's standing on the rooftop and everybody's like, we can't fight the Titans. We can't possibly win. And then she says, I can do it. I'm strong, real strong. None of you come close. I am a warrior. That's my favorite line. Also, oh, I got a woo for that. Oh, see, we're getting some energy in the room. What's up? Your, What's pers up? your personalities, like Mikasa and you, are like complete opposite. <laughs> I get that a lot, yeah. Um, so frequently I'm, uh, for better or worse, uh, frequently cast as um, an emotionally dead inside and traumatized person. <laughs> Um, I don't know what that says about me. Um, Pigeonhole. Yeah, it's weird. Directors are like, oh, is that actor, or I'm sorry, is that character really traumatized and really messed up and really sad? Trina would be great. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know what that says, but yeah, people say that a lot, um, which is cool, you know, uh, acting, so. <laughs> okay. Bye, Trina. Bye, honey bunny. I was wondering, what was one of your favorite characters that you have voiced over? One of my favorite characters that I have voiced. Uh, I have uh, voiced over 300 characters at this point. <laughs> All of them are uh, really important to me for various different reasons, um, whether that be that they paid a bill, <laughs> which is great, um, or... Doing the work. <laughs> right? Or, you know, they... Uh, changed my life. Some of them have literally changed my life. Uh, I can honestly say that Mikasa, being cast as Mikasa from Attack on Titan changed my life. Um, not only in um, the, the, um, the amount of work that I do now, but also I've met some amazing people uh, all over the world because conventions like this one brought me out and people like you wanted to hang out. And I think that um, that has been one of the biggest uh, blessings in my life. Uh, so maybe Mikasa, uh, but I really love Jiro as well. I think she's amazing, and I think that she, you know, um, I'm going to get on a soapbox if I may. Just Go, hey. get my box This out. is your show. <laughs> I think that uh, frequently, just across the board, right, uh, when I started doing anime about 20 years ago, things were different. Like a uh, female character, uh, one, couldn't be fully clothed. Two, uh, was... Uh, incredibly unproportional in her measurements. And three, um, wasn't a fighter, right? The girl was always smart, or the girl was always like, oh, whatever you want to do, you know? Um, and, and I think that there's a big shift happening. Uh, I love uh, Attack on Titan for a multitude of reasons, uh, but one of them is the uh, way that gender is portrayed in Attack on Titan. Uh, Mikasa is a female, and she's fully clothed, and... Um, she is the most uh, capable fighter, right? And she's also, she also acknowledges where her weaknesses are and leans on her team, and it's not just her following a dude. You know, uh, she's incredibly, especially in the first few seasons, was incredibly devoted in, to her adopted fam familial unit, i.e. Aaron and Armin. And um, she, gets to, she gets to be strong. And on the other hand, you know, men in... Men in pop culture are frequently only considered men if they are strong, if they have an eight pack, if they're, you know, super built and they, they can only be dumb, you know, it's, 
it's really interesting to see the shift over the past 20 years and in Attack on Titan, watching, you know, the, seeing the space for a woman that is strong and seeing the space for a man, Armin, who is emotionally connected to his feelings and is not physically strong, but is the best strategist. And similarly, the fact that there is a character in Attack on Titan that is not assigned a gender at all. You know, I think that that's a really important thing to see. If I was a kid, when I was little, growing up, there weren't, um, there weren't a lot of half Japanese actors. There weren't a lot of Asian actors on television. Uh, I was frequently told by agents when I was a child that um, I should change my last name, that I shouldn't push being uh, Japanese, that I should be more white, and all these other things, right? So I think that that shift away, right? That shift from this is what it is to be a woman, this is what it is to be uh, a human, this is what it is, and into something where everyone's accepted and, it, and there's a seat at the table for everyone and everyone is represented, I think that that's so important. And so for that reason, Attack on Titan and therefore Mikasa has a huge place in my heart. Um, and I think it's really important uh, that we continue to watch things like that because the more we watch them, the more they come out. And the more we watch things that aren't as great, the more we see things like that. So, soapbox over. Thank you for your time. <laughs> well said. Was it? Was it well said? Yeah, I, I think, don't know. I think it was. No, you're, you're, uh, you're right. I can't, like, the, the shift in the dynamic has definitely changed. It took a while to get there, It though. did. It yeah, really did. that was my bad. So, in the light of season four coming out, do you have a favorite moment from season four? Like, a favorite line, a favorite moment? Like, it doesn't have to be with your character. It can be any scene. Um, as far as favorite moments from season four, um... Gosh, she has a, Mikasa has a rough season four. So for my character in season four, like there's not a lot that's good that happens. Uh, and you guys should wait until you're in your teens to watch that. Yeah, don't, don't do what I <laughs> not did. Not now. This is not the time. Um, but yeah, in season four, I think um, my favorite <laughs> moment is probably when... Um, do you have a favorite moment? I actually have not watched it. <gasps> oh, no. Gas. I haven't watched season Gas. four, no. Yeah, That's I'm sorry. Okay. You do you, man. We got that Cowboy Bebop connection. Yes, we do. We, do. Um, we can stay friends. We can stay friends. <laughs> um, yeah, everything bad happens in season four. And I keep hoping that, like, the last half... So I don't know what happens. Please don't spoil anything for me. Um, but I keep hoping that in the last half of season four, when we finish recording that that everyone's gonna like get along and everything will just get fixed and they'll all move into like matching townhomes on the same neighborhood block and be friends, <laughs> have a game night. And that's like, that's a dream, right? Yeah, <laughs> like can't Aaron and Armin and Mikasa get a break? You know, like where's their spa episode? Um, yeah, so I don't, I, don't, I don't really have one. Do you have one? I like when um, Mikasa and Aaron meet again for the first time after the time skip. Like, I think you did a really good job with that line. Oh, thank you. And That's very sweet. Yeah, that was, it's just all so sad. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that was a great moment. Thank you so much for your question, Lauren. And thank you again for the drawing. Thank you for the drawing you gave me, too. <laughs> I will cherish it forever. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Have a good day. And we clap. Night. Hey! Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, if I may ask, what... What is one of your favorite moments from the recording studio? Do you have any enjoyable moments that you often reflect on and think fondly of when you, ref when you think about it now? Do I have any uh, fond moments from the recording booth that I think fondly of now? Um, yes, actually. Um, this might get a little dark. Uh, so I, um, my partner was diagnosed with leukemia in October of 2020. And we had to go, because we had to go into the hospital um, and the moment we stepped into the hospital, we couldn't leave at all, right? Like, we couldn't even step on the elevator, uh, or I, he couldn't, but I certainly couldn't get on the elevator to, like, go to the cafeteria or go outside or anything at all. Um, and in the, at, at that time, I was the lead in a show called Decadence, and um, my favorite moment recording is that I was in the hospital, and I had to call the producer, 
and say, hey man, I'm in the hospital, I can't leave uh, for the next 42 days, so uh, if you need to recast me, I totally get it. Um, do whatever you need to do for the show. And Funimation actually put the entire production of Decadence on hold for me, and then uh, Gino Palencia and Brina Palencia, Brina's my best friend and Gino's her brother, but he's also the uh, head sound magic man at Funimation, uh, they erected a makeshift booth for me out of sound blankets and tea stands uh, that I could erect and take down uh, every day. And so uh, the hospital, because nobody was allowed in the waiting room on that floor, the hospital allowed me to use the phone room on that floor. And then I was able to erect this sound blanket and this fort of blankets uh, to record from a hospital phone booth uh, for 42 days. Wow. Uh, that was the most amazing, that is definitely the most amazing recording moment of my life. Thank you for sharing, and I hope your partner's doing well. He's the best. I love him. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I actually didn't have a question until you said something probably about 20 minutes ago now. My question for you is, because there's a lot of great scenes in Game of Thrones. Yes. If you had to pick one, oh. like your favorite scene that you could just rewatch and you just you absolutely love it and why? Oh gosh, that's such a good question. Now we're we're talking. You love Game of Thrones from the TV show standpoint, or book standpoint, or both? I love both of them. Okay. I mean, the books are so rich and amazing, and I I have read them and listened to them uh, multiple times. Um, and gosh, that oh, that's a good question. I, I can give you mine real quick if you want. Oh, what's yours? When Jamie gets his hand cut off. Oh, no. Because it changes him as a character. Yeah. And in that moment, the actor just does such a fantastic job with his eyes and his eyes alone. When yeah. he looks and he looks yeah. at the camera and he just screams. Oh, my God. It, and it, that <clears throat> changes him for the rest of the show. It does. It totally changes Until him. Until the last episode. Bum, bum, bum. I don't want to spoil anything. So if, if there are any Game of Thrones fans that haven't seen all of it, Oops. you're muffs. But Littlefinger's death. Oh, oh my God. That's oh, I could watch that scene over and over and over and you over. Want, you want to talk about like the over. justice. <gasps> Absolute justice in oh, that scene. It was so good. And like Arya just like walking up and just like, like no big deal. Like that. Oh, so good. And then that moment between the sisters on the wall. I have two sisters, both of which I love and hate depending upon the day. And uh, that moment with the sisters on the wall, like I sent it to both of my sisters and neither of them care about Game of Thrones. They're like, what does this mean? I was like, we're the sisters. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my oh, all time favorite. That, that's a really good scene. So. so good, right? Awesome show. I haven't read the series, but my little brother, mm -hmm. I think he read it when he was like 12. So Aww. I don't know if that was the right material for him, but <laughs> he, he's okay now. So. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Or, yeah, we're doing it, we're doing it. So, oh gosh, I totally just blinked on my question. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> okay, so if you could live in any fictional world, what would it be and who would you be within that world? If I could live in any official world? Fictional, fictional. world. Fictional world. Which fictional world and who would I be? I mean, designing women was pretty good, but I don't think anyone knows what that is. <laughs> Um, right? <laughs> like, they just, like, on, hung out all day. Meshock Taylor and... Yeah, or Golden Girls. Oh, like Golden Girls. They're just sassy ladies. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't mind just being a sassy lady. They didn't have jobs. Like, where did their money Nothing come Nothing says you can't be a sassy lady. Yeah, but, like, being a sassy lady in, like, the late 80s. <laughs> I'm a sassy lady. You have dates coming over. <laughs> oh, Blanche. Um, but, yeah, so um, any fictional world, what, who would... Uh, gosh, um, I can't think of one, but I'm going to think on it. And before the end of the panel, I will answer it with a very good answer. Probably a food anime, but I have to pick which one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Also, I love your Adventure Time tie. It's amazing. I'm sorry? Uh, your tie, the Adventure she Time tie. I love it. She likes your tie. Oh, my tie. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, a young lady that works, uh, actually in the vendor hall. Her name's Carly. Uh, she makes my ties. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. awesome. That's Unfortunately, awesome. she didn't bring any for me to buy this show, so <laughs> she hasn't had time to make new ones. Well, that's awesome. And thank you so much. I love you as Mikasa. She's one of my favorite characters ever, and I'm cosplaying as her tomorrow, so. Oh, sick! Special. <laughs> thank, well, you. thank you. Bye, honey. Uh, hi, my name is Priscilla. Hi, Priscilla. Hi, so 
I was going to originally ask you a question in regards to your character as a keto, young a keto in Fruits Basket. Yes. But after discussing about uh, women in the entertainment, I have worked my way up to become a producer. So I'm currently a coordinator. But it's very intimidating because there's not as many women like me, especially Latina women. Mm -hmm. So you discussed about how you felt indifferent in uh, your culture while going up in the entertainment industry. So how did you combat those feelings? So thank you for sharing. And it is sometimes hard, right? It's sometimes hard to even bring up like, hey, I'm a woman in this space. And frequently it's a male dominated space and I need allies or I, I need somebody to hear me because it's hard, right? It's yeah. really hard. And I've been in, in several rooms and in several situations where there wasn't a lot of room for me, right? Um, and I'm small, so it does, I don't take up much. Uh, yeah. But yeah, um, I think uh, in this instance, um, I'm going to circle back to my older sister, Tara, and uh, just say um, there have been times, right, in my past where it's been like, oh, she's she's not white enough, or she's not this enough, or she's not that enough, um, or she's this, too much of this, or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's unfortunate that that happens. Yeah. Um, it's a little different, uh, producer-wise, actor-wise, um, but in general, my general uh, life philosophy and advice to anyone, uh, children under the age of 13, please plug your ears, but in general, uh, my, my advice to anybody that's being bullied my advice to anybody that, and whether that's bullied in the schoolyard or bullied in a boardroom, um, it happens everywhere and it's unfortunate. Uh, but those people are going through something that has nothing to do with you. Um, it has everything to do with what kind of trauma or issues they have. Um, and if you put in the work, if you put in the time, then you're going to succeed, right? In whatever you do. Um, it's just about working harder, and, and it's unfortunate that you have to work harder, but yeah. you work harder, and you don't listen to what they have to say if it's negative, and if they continue to say things that are negative, f*** them, because they don't matter. So, Thank you're you. doing great. Thank you. You just you keep too. doing you, okay? Thank you. You're awesome. And <laughs> it's PG-13. You're allowed one. Is it? <laughs> just one. Just one. Uh, I have another question. Yes. I was wondering, um, oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, Take your time, you're when, fine. We're just kicking it, man. When you're in the studio recording lines, do you, you, I understand that you get a script beforehand, but have you ever read a script and been surprised about something happening in the anime, like to the point of screaming or shock? Sure, we actually don't get the scripts ahead of time. Oh, you don't? So every time we go into the studio, um, depending upon the director and depending upon the actor, frequently you have no idea what you're going to be recording. Um, with Attack on Titan specifically, just to circle back to that, uh, Mike McFarland, the director, has worked with me on other projects like Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, Evangelion, etc. Um, and so he prefers that I not read ahead in the manga. So I have no idea what happens to Mikasa in the final season. I have no idea if they're going to get their townhouses. I hope they do. Um, but we find out in that moment. And there are frequently moments where I'm like, this is the worst. Like, if the lead character is dead in episode four, like, what kind of hope is there for the female lead? Not much. <laughs> not much. And job security wise, I'd like to stay alive. Um, so. Yeah, uh, there, there have been several times where I've been really upset and sad about uh, certain things, and uh, I just recently recorded something uh, that maybe I can talk about next Tuesday. Um, <laughs> uh, that was shocking, super shocking. But there, there, I, I'm kind of an overreactor in general, so there have been many times where I've just burst into tears or screamed or any number of things. And you find it out in that moment? Yeah like watch the scene in Japanese and read the script and then be like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. So. Thank you so much for being so well-spoken on the other issues about uh, women in the industry too. Oh, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. I don't know if, if, you know, I don't know how much that affects things and I don't know how much of a platform I have, but if I do have a platform and if people do want to listen, then... Yeah. My, my question, because I want to end this on a good note, is uh, if you wanted to pick 
uh, a character you voice and you wanted to like hang out with them, who would you pick? Um, have you seen Monster Hunter? I have not. I, I have not. I have played a couple hours of Monster Hunter, but I have not. That's cool. So in the anime of Monster Hunter, there's a little cat, an Iru. His name is Naviru. He sounds like this, and he loves donuts. That's all he does is eat donuts. I'd hang out with him and eat donuts. <laughs> That's very great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this isn't my question. It's my friend's. Okay. But I'll ask for her. Okay. And, yeah. She asked if, like, if you relate to Mikasa or if you share like any qualities with her. Do I relate to Mikasa and do I share any qualities with her? Well, Mikasa is half Japanese. <laughs> so am I. Um, she's half white. So am I. That's, that's cool. Um, so what else? Uh, she has brown hair. Normally, I don't have blonde hair. That's a lie. Um, but uh, yeah, I, um, I, um, I relate to her in her devotion to her friends. I have, uh, I'm very fortunate to have an amazing tribe of people in my life. And I am incredibly devoted to them and they to I. And um, I'm very lucky in that regard. Um, she has an adopted group of family, like family. Uh, I'm very close with my siblings and obviously my cousin. Uh, <laughs> and I'm very lucky in that aspect of my life. Um, I am not at all a skilled fighter. I am 100% positive that if I, Trina Nishimura, was in the world of Attack on Titan, I would be killed in season one probably episode one, probably by a boulder. Like, I wouldn't even get to Titan fighting. It'd just be like, I'm walking down the street, going to the store, and a boulder from the wall just falls on me. So not in that way. So mostly just the ethnicity, and uh, she's, you know, she has friends. So I have friends. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, you look awesome. Thank you. I met you yesterday, but I was villain Jiro. Oh, yeah. Wow, <laughs> you totally look different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously you, know, you look different, yeah. Shapeshifter. <laughs> um, so my question is, what was your favorite part of Yuri on Ice? My favorite part of Yuri on Ice is that my character's nickname is Chicken Nugget. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite part. I love that so that's much. That's adorable. <laughs> that's all. I just love that. <laughs> awesome. You look great, too. Ah, thanks. Uh, so, uh, in Fruits Basket, what is your favorite zodiac animal? Gosh, that's a hard one. What's your favorite? Ooh. Right? See, it's a hard one. Probably Kisa, the tiger, because she's super cute. Oh, that's And I love a good that she answer. just, like, bites everyone. <laughs> That's a really good answer. Can I steal your answer? Go I take for yours. It. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the question. Um, Hello again. Hi, and uh, I just wanted to like also ask the fruits basket related question. Okay. So when you voice a lot of characters, especially if they deal with trauma, mm -hmm. do you sometimes have to recuperate from acting oh, as yeah. the traumatic characters? Yeah, for sure. How do you? Uh, deal with it? Um, so that's one of my biggest uh, issues that I work on as an actor is coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I'm recording something and I, it's a, a person or a character that's gone through a lot or is going through a lot in that moment, uh, it's frequently hard for me to come back. Um, mm -hmm. Like, for example, uh, <laughs> there's a show called Steins Gate mm -hmm. uh, that you may or may not have seen and the character Makase uh, that I voice, uh, she goes through quite a lot, and it's um, really taxing and really hard, mm -hmm. um, and it was a lot uh, to take on, um, and a lot of emotional stuff, um, and it was hard for me to come back, and frequently when I would go home to my partner, um, he would be like, I would be really upset, and he'd be like, remember, I am not Okabe. And I'd be like, I don't know what's happening. And he's like, also, I ordered us pizza. And I was like, okay. So food is definitely like my comeback to like the physical senses of life. Um, so food is usually my comeback. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to have a partner that's a chef. So if I'm going to record something really hard uh, any particular day, he'll be like, hey, babe, break your legs. Also, is this a sad one? And if it is, then he'll be like, do we need pizza or tacos? What's happening tonight? <laughs> so that's pretty, I'm pretty fortunate in that re regard. 
Thank you for answering my question. It's my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much you. for asking the question. Hi, I was wondering if there was any surreal moment you had from one of your fans, like whenever they cosplayed for you or anything like that? Surreal moments that I've had from a fan. Um, okay, so a million years ago, like a lifetime ago, at least 15, um, I was at one of my very first conventions ever in uh, Philadelphia, I think, um, and I was there with Johnny Young Bosch, who's lovely and so sweet, and his band at the time. And um, this is back when computers used to be cubes. Uh, so they had a convention that had, uh, they were expecting like a couple thousand and some larger number, like 10,000. I don't know if that was the number, but just for a hyperbole and a roundabout number. So 10,000 people show up and they only had this one computer to check everyone in, right? And so, um, it's opening ceremonies and all the actors are on the stage and no one's in the room and the organizer, the promoter comes in and running in and it's like, I'm so sorry, like, we can't get anybody in, like, the computer is down, we only have one computer, we don't know what to do and, and is freaking out, right? Also, it's Philadelphia in the middle of winter, so there's a blizzard and people, I guess, started lining up at like five in the morning oh. and they had to call, like, the police because they weren't equipped and, like, Somebody was like, SWAT's coming. I have no idea why SWAT would need to be called, but SWAT's coming and like all this, like all this to do. And then they're like, Johnny, Trina, we need you to go outside and sign autographs and like keep everyone calm. And, and Johnny's like, cool. And I was like, I don't think that I want to do that. It's cold and I don't know if they'll know who I am and I don't know. And he was like, Trina, do you want to go? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. And Johnny was like, Trina, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, Johnny. Yeah, I want to go. <laughs> so they gave me this clipboard and a Sharpie. And um, frequently, if you're in a large crowd of people holding a clipboard, it looks like you know what you're doing, right? Um, and so I also have this complex where I'm like, I'm fine by myself, I'm fine. It's like my go-to word is, I'm fine. And uh, I, Johnny was like, hey, let's go sign. I was like, I'm fine, you go over there. I'm fine, you do you. And I was, uh, I was holding this clipboard and I got all turned around in this giant crowd of people and um, I looked up and I couldn't find, like the security people weren't there, the organizers weren't there, Johnny wasn't there, none of his bandmates were there, and it was just me and this clipboard and so many people. <laughs> and like all of these moms, like it, it's like a mom radar, and they were like, somebody's over there with a clipboard, they know what's going on, my babies are cold, and they all just like came at me. And everyone's like, like all of these moms are like momming me so hard, and they're like, we need to get inside. We have been waiting. What is happening and all this stuff and everyone's yelling and I'm like getting really scared. I'm like, I'm really sorry, you guys. If you guys want to just follow me, like, well, just go inside. It's going to be okay. And then like, like something happens and like they're yelling and everyone's yelling and the crowds, you know, when crowds are so like tight, you start to move. So I'm like moving and there's people yelling and there are all these moms that are mad at me. And then I like bump into this wall of a human being. And it's this dude in like full SWAT regalia. Ooh. And I just like grab onto his vest. I was like, my name is Trita. I don't know what's happening. I need to go inside. <laughs> and he takes his mask off and he's like, can I have your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> so that was my most, he wasn't actually SWAT. He was just cosplay. <laughs> that was my most surreal fan moment. And I went inside. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out, you thank guys. You if you much, have any everybody. more questions, I'll be at my table. <laughs>